Good evening. I'm Gloria Groom, the chair and the Mary and David Winton Green curator of painting and sculpture of Europe at the Art Institute of Chicago. And it's my pleasure to be here at the Garfield Park Conservatory and talking about an exhibition that is really a wonderful way to um, bring our institutions together. The, uh, oh, it's not moving. The exhibition Monet in Chicago opened to our members on September 3rd and after having been supposed to open on May 6th and we were delighted that so many people came out on this beautiful day to see the exhibition that for a while we were just kind of wondering would we be able to open it but it's here and it's up until January 18th so um, it will be our fall event. Here's just an overview. It's Monet in Chicago. It's the first time an exhibition has been devoted to the impact of this major impressionist artist, not only on the Art Institute of Chicago, but also the city of Chicago, its history of collecting and collectors up until today. And as you can see from this breakdown, it's almost 50-50 with the paintings that we've had in our collection of since 1922, 1933, and gifts that have been given. We've only bought two Monets. And so I'd like to do tonight is to give kind of an overview of the ex exhibition and to talk a little bit about Monet's love of flowers appropriately. So I'm also excited that we're here because this is the perfect place to be talking about Monet's garden. Now Monet, of course, we know him for his water lilies. Many of us have visited Giverny, but his love of flowers was very, very early in his career. He's probably out of all the impressionists, the most, uh, astute horticulturist of them all. And this is an, a painting that we have at the Art Institute uh, where you can see his home at Argentoy. It was probably the first time that he was able to afford a kind of middle-class home. He's here with his wife, Camille, and his first son, Jean. And you can see how he's beautifully planted these rows of uh, different kinds of flowers. I'm not a horticulturist, so I'm not gonna be much good at that. But what I want you to notice is, are these Chinese pots. They were import to China and um, he took them wherever he was living. And he had many different homes at this time because he wasn't the artist that we know today. He was still a fledgling artist, still struggling to maintain the lifestyle that he so wanted. And this is another painting later. It's at the National Gallery. And you can see that the same pots are there lining the pathway. And this was one of his ways of decorating and also of making his painting into a decoration with these wonderful tall sunflowers. He wasn't as interested in painting still lifes of flowers, however. He liked his flowers in nature. He liked seeing them, he liked planting them, he liked creating his own composition for his paintings about his life. And here you see on the left, the Dalias, which was a painting that was commissioned by him of him by his dealer, Paul Durand-Réal, and another smaller painting, both of which had to do with this interior of his dealer, an 18th century interior, and he was commissioned to fill these boiseries, the paneling, the wood paneling of the doors with these verticals and these squares and these small rectangles. It took him three years to complete. It was not a project that appealed to him very much and his dealer would sometimes bring him plants, bring him flowers in pots to kind of, you know, inspire him to get going. But he much preferred to be out of doors and only coming back into the studio when it was time to rework and to rethink a composition that started on plan air. Now, I love this painting. It's not in the exhibition, but it's in a private collection. And it's a painting of his stepdaughter, Martha, and she's in this amazing pathway uh, at Giverny, the, the final home for the Monet family. But I wanted to just show you how he would use flowers to help enhance the, the, the painting itself. The little girl stays exactly the same. And she's seen here in a kind of a family portrait, an extended family that we have in the exhibition. Um, 
of, of Monet's family, his two boys, one of which is in the foreground, the other older one is in the background, and three of the children of his second marriage to Alice Hoshide, who became Alice Monet in 1892. So you have this idea of plains, and the Giverny was not just the gardens that we know now, but it was also the fields around it, which he was totally enthralled with. And when he first started renting there, of course, he didn't have the gardens. That was only when he settled in and was able to buy the land and start to really create the paradise that we so associate with it. Instead, he was focusing on these 15 to 18 feet high stacks of wheat, which was right on the property, just adjacent to where he was renting and where he would eventually uh, buy his house. And you see, this was, of course, the famous series of stacks of wheat, which he showed all together, 15 of them, in 1891 at his dealer's Durand Rail. And it is really a part of the Chicago story because it was there that Bertha Palmer um, went to that exhibition and became enthralled. She already loved Monet, but now she was seeing something she had never seen before because it was completely new to art history. We think about series now and Warhol and how artists typically can work on a kind of a theme and variation. But for Monet and for the Impressionists at large, this was a brand new concept. And he was showing just these in one room, 15 of them. She bought three the first summer, and then she bought two the second year. So she owned five of the 15 stacks of wheat that were shown in 1891. Here's the way you see it at the Art Institute. You see it in a big room with other paintings by Monet, but if in this exhibition, we'll be able to show you how they might have looked when they were just being seen on their own in a very specific environment. Now, really, from the time of the grain stacks or the stacks of wheat, they're called so many things. In French, they're called moules, which just means stacks, so it's quite easy, but Americans have a hard time because we want to know what kind of grain, what kind of wheat they are. Um, but really, he doesn't go back to the flowers at all until he moves into Giverny more permanently uh, in the 1890s, and he starts to really think about his property as being a composition, as being his palette, his composition for the rest of his career. And here you have the wonderful Japanese bridge in the Art Institute's collection. It's, um, you know, it, there's a lot behind this. It looks so amazingly easy, but he created this. So you have to remember that he had the village government reroute the Ept River so that it would flow by his property. He built the Japanese bridge, even though he never went to Japan, he was thrilled by Japanese prints, by all things Japanese. And he started to buy the plants that he would use to populate the pond that is so much like this even today. Now, I'd like to get just a little bit into the story of the collecting, the collectors of these water lily paintings, because they are part of the story we're telling in the exhibition. This is Annie Swan Coburn, a woman we don't know very much about, but we do know she lived in the Blackstone Hotel from 1910 until her death in 1933. And she had all her paintings just kind of willy-nilly in the hotel rooms. Uh, the hotel that still exists today at Balboa. And so you see it took pride of place, the Japanese bridge, and before it came to us with her bequest in 1933. Martin A. Ryerson was another amazing collection collector. So we have the three. We have Bertha uh, Potter Palmer, and we have the Coburns, and then we have Ryerson. And here you see his water lilies that he bought in 1914. It's one of the, it's one of a series because by then Monet had started on this kind of serial thinking about what art should be, a new approach to art. And it's a series that he showed in 1909 at his dealer, his same dealer, Durand Royal. And they're all square and they're all kind of not, there's no horizon line. It's reflections coming down and reflections coming up very much focused on the water lilies in the pond. And here's Martin May Ryerson, uh, one of our most important donors, he and his wife, Carrie. He was also a trustee of the Art Institute from the 1890s to 1924. And he collected medieval, but he also collected Impressionism. And he, like Bertha Palmer, absolutely went to Paris and was buying Monet's 
the Monets that he was working on, that Monet was painting and showing he was buying. Um, here's a receipt we have as archives, which makes this exhibition even more fun because we can present some of these original letter documents. Here's a receipt for three paintings, and as you'll see at the very bottom is Leyland Theus, the, the water lilies, which he bought in 1914. And here's where he lived on Drexel Boulevard, which still exists today, a grand stately home. And in his wife's room, there's a big, you can see the arrow pointing to it, is the water lilies that um, also had pride of place. This is one of, I think, one of the, the most amazing series because you really see Monet moving away from pure observation and detailing into something much more symbolist, much more about the emotions and still using the very basic components, what he had at hand, it's like a still life, that fragment of his water lily pond. And in our um, catalog, this is the catalog we have for the exhibition, we're using it obviously throughout uh, to sort of advertise it because we find it is, this, it is probably the work that people most identify with Monet, these wonderful effervescent water lilies. My name um, in the exhibition, we have a moment where we want you to be totally immersed in the kind of research we've been doing on Monet throughout the years from 2014 when we did our first, uh, when we launched our online scholarly catalog. And so we have the 11 feet screens, which you'll see, and we talk about the way Monet painted. We start with the stacks. We have a small segment on the series he did in London when he went to visit his son, Michel, who was studying there. And we have, of course, the segment on the water lilies where we offer a deep dive into the ways he composed because Monet wasn't just painting a la prima. He wasn't just painting, drawing with a brush. There was no intermediary drawing. He would grasp nature on the fly out of doors, but he would take it back into the studio and there he would work out the compositions and he would struggle. It wasn't just an easy one-to-one, -one, but rather he wanted it to have a certain either effect within the series or within the only where he was going in his mind with the compositions. So we're bringing that to you in this exhibition, of the water lilies, where we talk about the things that were scraped off, that were there at one time. He had a much denser composition of water lilies, scrapes them off, and then starts again with a, 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 a kind of a more ethereal, more Japanese in some ways. And in this slide I'm showing you here, this image, you see the raking light. So you really see almost the three-dimensionality of what happens when he impastos these water lilies and leaves certain parts so that the canvas is showing through, but others are really thickly painted, and get a sense and slow down to really look at his paintings. Now, the water lily pond, as I said, was a progression. It wasn't something that he bought into. It was something that he built. And here on the left, you can see a very early stage when he's just thinking about getting the wisteria and the plants that he would need to make his um, pond and to go into a much richer detail, which is kind of his magnificent obsession. I mean, he always loved flowers, but now he had his own place. He knew this was permanent. He was already in his late 50s. He knew this was going to be it. He had his extended family. He had remarried. And so it was a way of settling in, but also putting his imprimatur on it. And I just want to take a quick detour here, something that I had met a couple who sell water lilies outside in northwestern France, and they have gone back to the original, um, in some ways, the, the, the man who propagated the water lilies with color. And this was Latour Maliac, it started in 1875, and they, he was aware that water lilies were white, and he started propagating them with American water lilies and came up with a variety of colors which he presented at the World's Fair in 1889, a World's Fair that Monet would have absolutely known about and been very, very interested given his uh, horticultural obsessions. And I think it's interesting that they have the archives, even though they're American couple, they live in the uh, Northeast of America, they have this farm 
and they have the archives from when Monet put in his order in 1894. So he's building the bridge and now he's going to populate it. And in red, I've marked the nymphaeas, the water lilies that he ordered. So you can see he ordered all kinds of other plants. He ordered lotuses. And luckily the lotuses didn't grow very well. And so we don't have lotus paintings. We have water lilies, which I think are much more exciting and all these different colors. In 1904 and 1908, he put in other orders, but as you can see, they're much, uh, they're much, he's got all the ground plants now. He's just concentrating on the water lilies in 1904. And then in 1908, he's basically putting ferns in. And now I'd like to talk just a little bit about the exhibition and what you're going to see. Uh, this is the mural that we had to lead into the exhibition. And this is the last room of the devoted to the water lily garden. So from 1899 until his death in 1926, with other trips to London, with other trips, he concentrated solely on making this his jewel, his absolute jewel, where he could go out of his front door, set up his easel and paint every single day. Um, the Japanese bridge is the first one, of course, 1899, and they get gradually more and more abstract. Here's the wall of those square paintings from 1906, 1907 that I told you about. And you can see, this is an earlier one, 1904. And you can see how this is more, in some ways, realistic. He's really capturing the way that the ferns and the undergrowth comes up from the bottom of the, of the pond, but also how it's reflected down. So you get this real sense of nature that you can, it's palpable, you can feel it. And that is the way we see the pond today. This is exactly the kind of experience you would have by going to Giverny. And then gradually he starts leaving nature in some ways and taking away, leaving more voids and really playing with light and dark and the space in a way that allows him to think about the composition away apart from the actual observed motif. This is that wall. Um, we call it our cathedral room. I wish we could have benches, but of course we can't have benches because of COVID. But um, it is a place where you want to metaphorically at least um, stay and meditate. And on the other side, we have the larger paintings of the series that he did as he was thinking about the murals that he wanted to do to celebrate France and that he offered to the French state, which were installed after his death. And these are the, of course, the murals in the Orangerie. Large scale, sometimes not finished, Many, many were left in his studio and were only um, sold in the 1950s. Um, and here I think is just, we should take a moment to see Monet at work. Oops. Can I get it going? It may take a second to do, but it's worth it because, you know, he lived until 1926. So there's a film of him at work. Most of the Impressionists were, were gone. I mean, Cezanne dies in 1906 and Pizarro in 1903. And here he is in this film by Sasha Guitry. Um, I think there's some, I think there is music going on. So I love it because everything that you see in the paintings, but you also see him wearing this amazing and this uh, kind of a set and modified that with this cigarette that you can't imagine is not, can't be lit because it never, it, it's just there, it just hangs on his lips, but he's, he's just painting what? Um, looking, going back to his canvas. And very much aware, of course, that he is being filmed, which was still a relatively novel enterprise at that time. And at that time, he was working in this very loose manner. You can see they became more and more, less and less about the object he was looking at. And so you have these kind of what they're called paysage d'eau, these um, water landscapes. 
and this one where he leaves so much of the canvas unfinished, it's stamped, which means it was left in his studio at the time of his death in 1926. And then when they family sold it, they put the stamp. And this is the kind of large scale uh, canvases he was working on bigger and bigger. Um, and it was at that time that the Ryersons visited him in 1920 when he was working for the, working on the Orangerie murals and went to Giverny and talked to him and tried to buy the myth is that it was $3 million, it's probably 3 million francs, tried to buy 30 of the water lily paintings and Monet wasn't having it, but he did greet them. Martin Ryerson was a, a good client. And um, so he, and he, as we know, he did end up with a water lily painting. Um, and it's wonderful to have this album because the family gave all of their archives to the museum. And this is the kind of work that he was doing at the very end and that ended up in the Orangerie in Paris in those two glorious rooms. So the Art Institute's ending is of a painting that is relatively unknown. It's in our collection, but it doesn't quite fit into the series of the water lilies that I've been showing you thus far. It's a painting called The Irises. It's a painting that's really almost like a cement. It's so heavily impastoed and it's so confusing. We, you know, it's like one of those paintings you don't know which side is up, but he's showing from the banks of the pond at Giverny and you can see how he's trying to catch the undergrowth and at the same time the reflection once again, but it's so encrusted with paint, it's so different. It's one of a very small series of paintings and it was one of the few of the, it's one of two paintings that we actually purchased that weren't just given to us in 1956. Catherine Koo, the then curator of modern art, bought this and uh, at that time it was a resurgence of interest in Monet because of these large scale abstract paintings which really spoke to the, the moment of abstract expressionism and color field painting. So that is the end of the exhibition. And this is, I just wanted to show you this because it's Catherine Koo on the left walking and there's the queen coming to visit Chicago in 1959. And what did she want to see? She wanted to see the water lilies. And so the big water, the irises is behind her and you can see the water lily bridge is uh, next to the prince. And now, because they're taking a walk through the flowers of Monet, I would like us to also take a walk with the man who created the artist garden at the Garfield Park Conservatory. Thank you. Yeah, this is incredible. Tell me about it. Um, well, this is the artist garden here at Garfield Park Conservatory. And every year we try to uh, create a new style, a new garden of an artist. It doesn't have to be a visual, a painter, it could be a photographer along that line. Um, so this year it just worked out so well that we got to work with the Art Institute in Monet. Because the garden itself, just lends itself to Monet with the lays, the arches, the espaliers. Wow. It's got all the different layers, you know, the different heights. And is that, I know you went to Giverny. Is that, is that something that you really appreciated or? Well, again, he did so much uh, interplanting. So I wanted to show those plants in these nice uh, sections rather than losing them in the paint, in the, uh, garden mm -hmm. but of course there's all these different heights textures um colors that i just wanted to bring in it's beautiful thank you so did did um are are these american flowers i mean did he buy his seeds do you think he bought them in I, i'm not sure about a... that yet um i know there are detailed lists of what he did grow so so what I tried to do was get the exact same species, but the variety is going to be different than what he would have had. So I wanted to point this out. The guard, the um, conservatory was opened in 1908. And it was designed by Jens Jensen, landscape architect. And what he did was very new. Uh, he fashioned the roof line to be haystacks. 
Wow. That's so, so it's cool. just tied in really well. <laughs> and this is our interpretation of haystacks here. It's wonderful. So the 15 to 18 feet high? Yeah, high. <laughs> <laughs> for for uh, yes. mice. Okay, we're going to keep walking. I wonder what Giverny looks like at this time of year. You think it looks like this? Is it the same growing patterns? Mm -hmm. Until um, maybe our first frost or something like that. So hopefully we're going to try to get to the end of October. Oh, I hope so. I want to oh, look at these. And I wanted to point out the rose standards here. These rose trees. He was a big fan of uh, the rose trees in his paintings as well in his garden. So I had to incorporate these. Yeah. They're not, these particular ones aren't hardy to our region. Um, they are susceptible to wind damage because of their height, that type of thing. So that's why we put them here to have the boxwood lock the, the wind. Although the past weekend, you know. <laughs> they look pretty good, especially after last weekend. Oh, these are beautiful. I, I wish you have to kind of point out what these are. Like, I don't, what are these? These are amazing. This is Cleome. Mm -hmm. um, did, he, did he plant that? I'm not sure, but I, he was in love with it. So. Yeah. Yeah. And I like the small petals. Yeah, I mean, it's such a hybrid of something that looks scary and then it just <laughs> blossoms out. Where do we go next? Uh, we're going to go down the main aisle here. Okay. Um, he loved his cosmos as well. Was it this particular variety? I'm not sure, but he did love his cosmos. So we're going to talk about his love of nasturtiums. Um, he had these in his LAs. He initially, the story goes, he initially uh, wanted dwarf nasturtiums. <laughs> I planted the wrong one, and so they came over the edges. Yes. And every, and every year, year he repeated that, that because he loved books. Yeah, you get the feeling that the LA was was a concept, but he liked the intermingling, yeah. playfulness of it. Yeah, yeah. And yet, I wonder well, when you look at a Monet painting, you actually can identify. I can. <laughs> Some wow! Of the, wow! Something. I'm looking at the paint, and you're like, Ooh. yeah, I'm like, oh, I know that petal. I know wow. that leaf, so I have to be on top of it. I can't necessarily look at it from a small photograph, but. Wow. And he loved his asters, which is the purple flower here. And of course, this is our little uh, honor of the water lilies. Oh, I love this. Look how pretty they are. And these are tropical. He would not, be, he would not grow tropicals, but we use them because they last longer. The blooms last longer, and they're very fragrant. And they're colorful. Yeah, they are. Yeah. I think it's wonderful they're still selling the water lilies that he yeah, ordered. Yeah, yes, definitely. Yeah. OK, sorry about that. Are so these are these just, they're, they're amazing, the way you planted them. They're so nesting. Yeah. Stuff. Wow. And we know he loved his geranium, so there's a little homage there. And then his espaliers. He had oh. um, initially had, when he bought Giovanni, it was an orchard, I believe, a fruit right, orchard, and right. he tore down much of it. And he trained his um, some new apple trees into espaliers to, to form a living oh, these fence. These were apple trees, wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I love the fact that you have either a Monet painting or something yeah. that explains it. And so, yeah, this is uh, it's educational and beautiful at the same time. Wow. Is it edible? Uh, I wouldn't. <laughs> the birds, the birds, and the, the uh, squirrels certainly love them. Wow. Oh, the richness. And I love these. Yeah, I love these I know. flowers. They're so beautiful. Yeah, we're losing some of them, but. Uh... No, but the way they, even that is really yeah, interesting. Is. They start looking like a, some kind of a vegetable. 
speaking and you've of got, vegetables. You've got gourds, yeah, or what is that? We've got um, squash here, squash? right? Squash, okay. Mm -hmm. It's a French squash, and Oh, I, yeah. It's just unusual to see, um, just to see a, a uh, pumpkin vine in a flower in garden. In a flower garden, uh, yeah. You always yeah, think of the right. potager on one side and the flowers on the other. Huh. <laughs> Shall we continue? <laughs> wow. And I love that, too. I mean, that is... Uh, Mm -hmm. Very Giverny with the with the vines growing up. It are they always here? Yeah. Okay, they always and that's here? part of the nineteen oh yes. and that's part of the nineteen oh nine. No, 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 this was this was put in eighteen years ago. <laughs> okay, not so historical. Okay. <laughs> We've got a little bit. I don't know if uh, to be filmed or not, but back here we have bamboo which he was also a huge fan of. That's just a nice little space to go inside there and have wow. a little seat. Now, how do people, do they come off the street into the garden? Is that yes, that? yes, we have a gate, a gate here on Central Avenue, Central Park Avenue. Okay, so you come right to the garden, and it's, okay. Mm -hmm. You can either park on the street or you can park in our uh, public parking space. And uh, the hours are 10 until 5, I believe. Yes. Every day? Uh, except for Monday and Tuesday. Thank you okay. for asking. 